Gun for Hire by Mac Reynolds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Gun for Hire. Joe Prantera called softly, Al. The pleasurable, comfortable, warm feeling began spreading over him, the way it always did. The older man stopped and squinted, but not suspiciously, even now. The evening was dark. It was unlikely that the other even saw the circle of steel that was the mouth of the shotgun barrel, now resting on the car's window ledge. "'Who is it?' he growled. Joe Prantera said softly, "'Big Lewis sent me, Al.' And he pressed the trigger. At that moment the universe caved inward upon Joseph Marie Prantera. There was nausea and nausea upon nausea. There was a falling through all space and through all time. There was doubling and twisting and twitching of every muscle and nerve. There was pain, horror, and tumultuous fear. And he came out of it as quickly and completely as he'd gone in. He was in, he thought, a hospital, and his first reaction was to think, this here California, everything different. Then his second thought was, something went wrong. Big Lewis, he ain't going to like this. He brought his thinking to the present. So far as he could remember, he hadn't completely pulled the trigger. That at least meant that whatever the rap was, it wouldn't be too tough. With luck, the syndicate would get him off with a couple of years at Quinton. A door slid open in the wall, in a way that Joe had never seen a door operate before. This here California. The clothes on the newcomer were wrong, too. For the first time, Joe Prantera began to sense an alienness, a something that was awfully wrong. The other spoke precisely and slowly, the way a highly educated man speaks a language which he reads and writes fluently, but has little occasion to practice vocally. You have recovered? Joe Prantera looked at the other expressionlessly. Maybe the old duck was one of those foreign doctors, like. The newcomer said, You have undoubtedly been through a most harrowing experience. If you have any untoward symptoms, possibly I could be of assistance. Joe couldn't figure out how he stood. For one thing, there should have been some kind of police guard. The other said, Perhaps a bit of stimulant. Joe said flatly, I want a lawyer. The newcomer frowned at him. A lawyer? I ain't saying nothing. Not until I get a mouthpiece. The newcomer started off on another tack. My name is Lawrence Reston Farrell. If I am not mistaken, you are Joseph Salviati Prantera. Salviati happened to be Joe's mother's maiden name. But it was unlikely this character could have known that. Joe had been born in Naples, and his mother had died in childbirth. His father hadn't brought him to the States until the age of five, and by that time he had a stepmother. "'I want a mouthpiece,' Joe said flatly, "'or let me out of here.' Lawrence Reston Farrell said, "'You are not being constrained. There are clothes for you in the closet there.' Joe gingerly tried swinging his feet to the floor and sitting up, while the other stood watching him strangely. He came to his feet, with the exception of a faint nausea, which brought back memories of that extreme condition he'd suffered during—during during what? He hadn't the vaguest idea of what had happened. He was dressed in a hospital-type nightgown. He looked down at it and snorted and made his way over to the closet. It opened on his approach, the door sliding back into the wall in much the same manner as the room's door had opened for Reston Farrell. Joe Prantera scowled and said, "'These ain't my clothes.' "'No, I am afraid not.' "'You think I'd be seen dead wearing this stuff? What is this, some religious crackpot hospital?' Reston Farrell said, "'I am afraid, Mr. Salviati Prantera, 
that these are the only garments available, I suggest you look out the window there. Joe gave him a long, chill look, and then stepped to the window. He couldn't figure the other, unless he was a fruitcake. Maybe he was in some kind of pressure cooker, and this was one of the fruitcakes. He looked out, however, not on the lawns and walks of a sanitarium, but upon a wide boulevard of what was obviously a populous city. And for a moment again... Joe Prantera felt the depths of nausea. This was not his world. He stared for a long, long moment. The cars didn't even have wheels, he noted dully. He turned slowly and faced the older man. Reston Farrell said compassionately, Try this, it's excellent cognac. Joe Prantera stared at him, and finally, flatly, What's it all about? The other put down the unaccepted glass. We were afraid first realization would be a shock to you, he said. My colleague is in the adjoining room. We will be glad to explain to you if you will join us there. I want to get out of here, Joe said. Where would you go? The fear of police, of Al Rossi's vengeance, of the measures that might be taken by Big Louie on his failure— were now far away. Reston Farrell had approached the door by which he had entered, and it reopened for him. He went through it without looking back. There was nothing else to do. Joe dressed, then followed him. In the adjoining room was a circular table that would have accommodated a dozen persons. Two were seated there now, papers, books, and soiled coffee cups before them, there had evidently been a long wait. Reston Farrell, the one Joe had already met, was tall and drawn of face with a chain-smoker's nervousness. The other was heavier and more at ease. They were both, Joe estimated, somewhere in their middle fifties. They both looked like docks. He wondered all over again if this was some kind of pressure cooker. But that didn't explain the view from the window. Reston Farrell said, May I present my colleague, Citizen Warren Brett James? Warren, this is our guest from, from, yesteryear. Mr. Joseph Salviati Prantera. Brett James looked at him, friendly so far as Joe could see. He said gently, I think it would be Mr. Joseph Prantera, wouldn't it? The maternal lineage was almost universally ignored. His voice, too, gave the impression he was speaking a language not usually on his tongue. Joe took an empty chair, hardly bothering to note its alien qualities. His body seemed to fit into the pieces of furniture, as though it had been molded to his order. Joe said, "'I think maybe I'll take that there drink, Doc.' Reston Farrell said, Of course, and then something else Joe didn't get. Whatever the something else was, a slot opened in the middle of the table, and a glass, so clear of texture as to be all but invisible, was elevated. It contained possibly three ounces of golden fluid. Joe didn't allow himself to think of its means of delivery. He took up the drink and bolted it. He put the glass down and said carefully, "'What's it all about, huh?' Warren Brett James said soothingly, "'Prepare yourself for somewhat of a shock, Mr. Prantera. "'You are no longer in Los Angeles. "'You think I'm stupid? "'I can see that.' "'I was about to say, Los Angeles of 1960. Uh, "'Mr. Prantera, we welcome you to Nuevo Los Angeles.' "'To where?' to Nuevo Los Angeles, and to the year... Brett James looked at his companion. What is the date, old calendar? 2133, Reston Farrell said. 2133 A.D., they would say. Joe Prantera looked from one of them to the other, scowling. What are you guys talking about? Warren Brett James said softly, Mr. Prantera... You are no longer in the year 1960. 
you are now in the year 2133. He said, uncomprehendingly, You mean I've been, like, uh, unconscious for— He let the sentence fall away as he realized the impossibility. Brett James said gently, Hardly for one hundred and seventy years, Mr. Prantera. Reston Farrell said, I am afraid we are confusing you. Briefly, we have transported you, I suppose one might say, from your own era to ours. Joe Prantera had never been exposed to the concept of time travel. He had simply never associated with anyone who had ever even remotely considered such an idea. Now he said, You mean like I've been asleep all that time? Not exactly, Brett James said, frowning. Reston Farrell said, So Suffice to say you are now one hundred and seventy-three years after the last memory you have. Joe Prantera's mind suddenly reverted to those last memories, and his eyes narrowed dangerously. He felt suddenly at bay. He said, Maybe you guys better let me in on what's this all about. Rustin Farrell said, Mr. Prantera, we have brought you from your era to perform a task for us. Joe stared at him, and then at the other. He couldn't believe he was getting through to them, or at least they were to him. Finally, he said, If I get this, you want me to do a job for you? That is correct. Joe said, You guys know what kind of jobs I do? That is correct. Like hell you do. You think I'm stupid? I never even seen you before. Joe Prantera came abruptly to his feet. I'm getting out of here. For the second time, Reston Farrell said, Where would you go, Mr. Prantera? Joe glared at him, then sat down again as abruptly as he'd risen. Let's thought all over again. I got this straight. You brought me some screwy way all the way here. Okay, I'll buy that. I seen what it looks like out that window. The real comprehension was seeping through to him even as he talked. Everybody I know, Jesse, Tony, the kid, Big Lewis, everybody, they're dead. Even Big Lewis. Yes, Brett James said, his voice soft. They are all dead, Mr. Prantera. Their children are all dead, and their grandchildren. The two men of the future said nothing more for long minutes, while Joe Prantera's mind whirled its confusion. Finally, he said, What's this bit about you wanting me to give it to some guy? That is why we brought you here, Mr. Prantera. You were, you are, a professional assassin. Hey, wait a minute now. Reston Farrell went on, ignoring the interruption. There is small point in denying your calling. Pray remember that at the point when we transported you, you were about to dispose of a contemporary named Alfonso Annunziata Rossi, a citizen, I might say, whose demise would probably have caused small dismay to society. They had him pegged, all right. Joe said, but why me? Why don't you get some heavy from now? Somebody knows the ropes these days. Brett James said, Mr. Prantera, there are no professional assassins in this age, nor have there been for over a century and a half. Well, then do it yourself. Joe Prantera's irritation over this whole complicated mess was growing, and already... He was beginning to long for the things he knew, for Jesse and Tony and the others, for his favorite bar, for the lasagna down at Papa Giovanni's. Right now, he would have welcomed a calling down at the hands of Big Lewis. Reston Farrell had come to his feet and walked to one of the large room's windows. He looked out as though unseeing. Then, his back turned, he said, "'We have tried, but it is simply not in us, Mr. Prantera. "'You mean you're yellow?' "'No, if by that you mean afraid. 
It is simply not within us to take the life of a fellow creature, not to speak of a fellow man. Joe snapped. Everything you guys say sounds crazy. Let's start all over again. Brett James said, Let me do it, Lawrence. He turned his eyes to Joe. Mr. Prantera, in your own era, did you ever consider the future? Joe looked at him blankly. In your day, you were confronted with national and international problems, just as we are today, and just as nations were a century or a millennium ago. Sure, okay, so we had problems. I know what you mean, like wars and depressions and dictators and like that. Yes, like that, Brett James nodded. The heavy set man paused a moment. Yes, like that, he repeated. That we confront you now indicates that the problems of your day were solved. Hadn't they been, the world most surely would have destroyed itself. Wars? Our pedagogues are hard put to convince their students that such ever existed. More than a century and a half ago, our society eliminated the reasons for international conflict. For that matter, he added musingly, we eliminated most international boundaries. Depressions, shortly after your own period, man awoke to the fact that he had achieved to the point where it was possible to produce an abundance for all with a minimum of toil. Overnight, for all practical purposes, the whole world was industrialized, automated. The second industrial revolution was accompanied by revolutionary changes in almost every field, certainly in every science. Dictators? Your ancestors found, Mr. Prantera, that it is difficult for a man to be free so long as others are still enslaved. Today the democratic ethic has reached a pinnacle never dreamed of in your own era. Okay, okay, Joe Prantera growled. So everybody's got it made. What I want to know is, what's all this about me giving it to somebody? If everything's so great, how come you want me to knock this guy off? Reston Farrell bent forward and thumped his right index finger twice on the table. The bacterium of hate, a new strain, has found the human race unprotected from its disease. We had thought our vaccines immunized us. What's that supposed to mean? Brett James took up the ball again. Mr. Prantera, have you ever heard of Genghis Khan, of Tamerlane, Alexander, Caesar? Joe Prantera scowled at him emptily. Or, more likely, of Napoleon, Hitler, Stalin? Sure, I heard of Hitler and Stalin. Joe growled. I ain't stupid. The other nodded. Such men are unique. They have a drive, a drive to power which exceeds by far the ambitions of the average man. They are genii in their way, Mr. Prantera, genii of evil. Such a genius of evil has appeared on the current scene. Now we're getting somewheres, Joe snorted. So you got a guy what's a little ambitious like, eh? And you guys ain't got the guts to give it to him. Okay, what's in it for me? The two of them frowned, exchanged glances. Rustin Farrell said, You know that is one aspect we had not considered. Brett James said to Joe Prantera, had we not, uh, taken you at the time we did, do you realize what would have happened? Sure, Joe grunted. <laughs> I would have let old Al Rossi have it right in the guts five times. Then I would have took the plane back to Chi. Brett James was shaking his head. No. You see, by coincidence, 
a police squad car was coming down the street just at that time to arrest Mr. Rossi, you would have been apprehended. As I understand California law of the period, your life would have been forfeit, Mr. Prantera. Joe winced. It didn't occur to him to doubt their word. Reston Farrell said, As to reward Mr. Prantera, we have already told you there is ultra-abundance in this age. Once this task has been performed, we will sponsor your entry into present-day society. Competent psychiatric therapy will soon remove your present— Wait a minute now. You figure on getting me candled by some head-shrinker, eh? <laughs> no thanks, Buster. I'm going back to my own— Brett James was shaking his head again. I am afraid there is no return, Mr. Prantera. Time travel works but in one direction, with the flow of time stream. There can be no return to your own era. Joe Prantera had been rocking with the mental blows he had been assimilating, but this was the final haymaker. He was stuck in this squaresville of a world. Joe Prantera, on a job, was thorough, careful, painstaking, competent. He spent the first three days of his life in the year 2133 getting the feel of things. Brett James and Reston Farrell had been appointed to work with him. Joe didn't meet any of the others who belonged to the group which had taken the measures to bring him from the past. He didn't want to meet them. The fewer persons involved, the better. He stayed in the apartment of Reston Farrell. Joe had been right. Reston Farrell was a medical doctor. Brett James evidently had something to do with the process that had enabled them to bring Joe from the past. Joe didn't know how they'd done it, and he didn't care. Joe was a realist. He was here. The thing was to adapt. There didn't seem to be any hurry. Once the deal was made, they left it up to him to make the decisions. They drove him around the town when he wished to check the traffic arteries. They flew him about the whole vicinity. From the air, Southern California looked much the same as it had in its own time. Oceans, mountains, and to a lesser extent deserts are fairly permanent even against man's corroding efforts. It was while he was flying with Brett James on the second day that Joe said, "'How about Mexico? Can I make the get to Mexico?' The physicist looked at him questioningly. "'Get?' he said. Joe Pantera said impatiently, "'The getaway. After I give it to this Howard Temple Tracy guy, I gotta go on the run, don't I?' "'I see.' <clears throat> Brett James cleared his throat. Mexico is no longer a separate nation, Mr. Prantera. All North America has been united into one unit. Today there are only eight nations in the world. Where's the nearest? South America. That's a hell of a long way to go on a get. We hadn't thought of the matter being handled in that manner. Joe eyed him in scorn. Oh, you didn't, huh? What happens after I give it to this guy? I just sit around and wait for the cops to put the arm on me? Brett James grimaced in amusement. Mr. Prantera, this will probably be difficult for you to comprehend, but there are no police in this era. Joe gaped at him. No police? What happens if you gotta throw some guy in stir? If I understand your idiom correctly, you mean prison. There are no prisons in this era, Mr. Prantera. Joe stared. No cops? No jails? What stops anybody? What stops anybody from just going into some bank-like and collecting up all the bread? Brett James cleared his throat. Mr. Prantera, there are no banks. No banks? You gotta have banks. And no money to put in them. We found it a rather antiquated method of distribution well over a century ago. Joe had given up. 
Now he merely stared. Brett James said reasonably, We found we were devoting as much time to financial matters in all their endless ramifications, including bank robberies, as we were to productive efforts. So we turned to more efficient methods of distribution. On the fourth day, Joe said, Okay, uh, let's get down to facts. Some of the things you guys say don't stick together so good. Now, first place, where's this guy, Temple Tracy, you want knocked off? Reston, Farrell, and Brett James were both present. The three of them sat in the living room of the latter's apartment, sipping a sparkling wine which seemed to be the prevailing beverage of the day. For Joe's taste, it was insipid stuff. Happily, rye was available to those who wanted it. Reston Farrell said, "'You mean, where does he reside? Why, here in this city?' "'Well, that's handy, eh?' Joe scratched himself thoughtfully. "'You got somebody can finger him for me?' "'Finger him?' "'Look, before I can give it to this guy, I gotta know some place where he'll be at some time. Get it? Like Al Rossi.' My finger, he works in Rossi's house, see? He lets me know every Wednesday night, eight o'clock, Al leaves the house all by himself. Okay, so I can make plans like to give it to him. Joe Prantero wound it up reasonably. You gotta have a finger. Brett James said, Why not just go to Temple Tracy's apartment and, uh, dispose of him? Just walk in, eh? You think I'm stupid? How do I know how many witnesses hanging around? How do I know if the guy's carrying heat? Heat? A gun, a gun. You think I'm stupid? I come to give it to him and he gives it to me instead. Dr. Reston Farrell said, Howard Temple Tracy lives alone. He customarily receives visitors every afternoon, largely potential followers. He is attempting to recruit members to an organization he is forming. It would be quite simple for you to enter his establishment and dispose of him. I assure you he does not possess weapons. Joe was indignant. Just like that, eh? he said sarcastically. Then what happens? How do I get out of the building? Where's my get car parked? Where do I hide out? Where do I dump the heat? Dump the heat. Get rid of the gun. You want I should get caught with the gun on me? I'd wind up in the gas chamber so quick. See here, Mr. Prantera, Brett James said softly. We no longer have capital punishment, you must realize. Okay, I still don't want to get caught. What is the rap these days, huh? Joe scowled. You said they didn't have no jails anymore. This is difficult for you to understand, I imagine, Reston Farrell told him, but you see we no longer punish people in this era. That took a long, unbelieving moment to sink in. You mean, like, no matter what they do? That's crazy. Everybody'd be running around giving it to everybody else. The motivation for crime has been removed, Mr. Prantera. Reston Farrell attempted to explain. A person who commits a violence against another is obviously in need of medical care, and consequently receives it. You mean, like if I steal a car or something, they just take me to a doctor? Joe Prantera was unbelieving. Why would anyone wish to steal a car? Reston Farrell said easily. But if I give it to somebody... You will be turned over to a medical institution. Citizen Howard Temple Tracy is the last man you will ever kill, Mr. Prantera. A chilliness was in the belly of Joe Prantera. He said, very slowly, very dangerously, You guys figure on me getting caught, don't you? Yes, Brett James said evenly. Well then, figure something. Then else, you think I'm stupid? Mr. Prantera, Dr. Reston Farrell said, there has been as much progress in the field of psychiatry in the past two centuries as there has in any other. 
Your treatment would be brief and painless, believe me. Joe said coldly, And what happens to you guys? How do you know I won't rat on you? Brett James said gently, The moment after you have accomplished your mission, we plan to turn ourselves over to the nearest institution to have determined whether or not we also need therapy. Now I'm beginning to wonder about you guys, Joe said. Look, all over again. What do you want to give it to this guy for? The doctor said, We explained the other day, Mr. Prantera, Citizen Howard Temple Tracy is a dangerous, atavistic, evil genius. We are afraid for our institutions if his plans are allowed to mature. Well, if you got things so good, everybody's got it made like who listened to him? The doctor nodded at the validity of the question. Mr. Prantera, Homo sapiens is a unique animal. Physically, he matures at approximately the age of thirteen. However, mental maturity and adjustment is often not fully realized until thirty or even more. Indeed, it is sometimes never achieved. Before such maturity is reached, our youth are susceptible to romantic appeal. Nationalism, chauvinism, racism, the supposed glory of the military, all seem romantic to the immature. They rebel at the orderliness of present society. They seek entertainment in excitement. Citizen Temple Tracy is aware of this, and finds his recruits among the young. Okay, so this guy is dangerous. You want him knocked off before he screws everything up? But the way things are, there's no way of making a get. So you'll have to get some other patsy, not me. I am afraid you have no alternative, Brett James said gently. Without us, what will you do? Mr. Prantera, you do not even speak the language. What do you mean? I don't understand some of the big words you eggheads use, but I get by, okay? Brett James said, Amer English is no longer the language spoken by the man in the street, Mr. Prantera. Only students of such subjects may any longer speak such tongues as Amer English, French, Russian, or the many others that once confused the race with their limitations as a means of communication. You mean there's no place in the whole world where they talk American? Joe demanded, aghast. Dr. Reston Farrell controlled the car. Joe Prantera sat in the seat next to him, and Warren Brett James sat in the back. Joe had, tucked in his belt, a forty-five caliber automatic, once displayed in a museum. It had been more easily procured than the ammunition to fit it, but that problem, too, had been solved. The others were nervous, obviously repelled by the very conception of what they had planned. Inwardly, Joe was amused. Now that they had got in the clutch, the others were on the verge of chickening out. He knew it wouldn't have taken much for them to cancel the project. It wasn't any answer, though. If they allowed him to call it off today, they'd talk themselves into it again before the week was through. Besides, Already Joe was beginning to feel the comfortable, pleasurable, warm feeling that came to him on occasions like this. He said, You sure this guy talks American, huh? Warren Brett James said, Quite sure. He is a student of history. And he won't think it's funny I talk American to him, huh? He'll undoubtedly be intrigued. They pulled up before a large apartment building that overlooked the area once known as Wilmington. Joe was coolly efficient now. He pulled out the automatic, held it down below his knees, and threw a shell into the barrel. He eased the hammer down, thumbed on the safety, 
stuck the weapon back in his belt and beneath the jacket-like garment he wore. He said, Okay, see you guys later. He left them and entered the building. An elevator, he still wasn't used to their speed in this era, whooshed him to the penthouse duplex occupied by Citizen Howard Temple Tracy. There were two persons in the reception room, but they left on Joe's arrival without bothering to look at him more than glancingly. He spotted the screen immediately and went over and stood before it. The screen lit and revealed a heavyset, dour of countenance man seated at a desk. He looked into Joe Prantera's face, scowled, and said something. Joe said, Joseph Salviati Prantera to interview Citizen Howard Temple Tracy. The other's shaggy eyebrows rose. Indeed, he said. In Amer English? Joe nodded. Enter, the other said. A door had slid open on the other side of the room. Joe walked through it and into what was obviously an office. Citizen Temple Tracy sat at a desk. There was only one other chair in the room. Joe Prantera ignored it and remained standing. Citizen Temple Tracy said, What can I do for you? Joe looked at him for a long, long moment. Then he reached down to his belt and brought forth the forty-five automatic. He moistened his lips. Joe said softly, You know what this here is? Temple Tracy stared at the weapon. It's a handgun. Chirka, I would say, about 1925 old calendar. What in the world are you doing with it? Joe said very slowly, Chief, in the line you're in these days, you need a heavy around with one of these. Otherwise, Chief, you're gonna wind up in some gutter with a lot of holes in you. What I'm doing, I'm asking for a job. You need a good man knows how to handle one of these, Chief. Citizen Howard Temple Tracy eyed him appraisingly. Perhaps, he said, you are right at that. In the near future, I may well need an assistant, knowledgeable in the field of violence. Tell me more about yourself. You surprise me considerably. Sure, Chief. It's kind of a long story, though. First off, I better tell you you got some bad enemies, Chief. Two guys special named Brett James and Doc Reston Farrell. I think one of the first jobs I'm going to have to do for you, Chief, is to give it to those two. End of Gun for Hire by Mac Reynolds